the Chiefs and Dolphins are freezing their baguettes off, and the coaching carousel is pretty much off the rails. Let's get after it on this rare Saturday edition of Football Friday. What is up, everybody? Happy Saturday. Happy Super Wild Card Weekend to you NFL watchers out there. It is the Iceman Matt Freights. That is the coach, Brad Powell. And it is the rare Saturday football Friday as we are coming to you live during the Dolphins and Chiefs game, which looks 100% miserable. And you could not pay me enough to be at that game. So, Coach, how you doing, buddy? Iceman, doing well. Uh, yeah, it looks a little chilly a little. there in Kansas City. And... I agree. I don't know that I would brave those temperatures for uh, for any game uh, at this age anyways. Who knows? No. Um, I give my dad crap because anytime we're going to go to Notre Dame, he's always concerned of how late in the year it's going to be and what the weather will be like in South Bend. And, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, man, like, how, many, how often do you get the chance to go, you know, not you know, maybe once a year? So I'm like, I could deal with it. Um, and it always makes for a fun story after the fact, kind of. Uh, but you know, people are going to say, hey, I was at the Chiefs Dolphins game when it was negative six degrees or whatever it is. But um, yeah, we've kind of I hope we don't get two two blowouts today. The Texans handled business um, in the first game earlier today. The Browns looked um, the abysmal. Browns. Yeah, they look, they look <laughs> like the Browns. the Browns. Yeah. And uh, my my wonderful picks in true coach fashion are off to a terrible start. Yes. So Coach and I did put our picks for today's or this weekend's action and our Super Bowl picks on Twitter and on Facebook. So we will probably be dead wrong as the playoffs unfold here over the next month or so. So we are live during this game and we will periodically check into the game, but it is not a watch party. This is an actual football Friday where we're going to go over a lot of different stuff. So we will not be doing our usual fare where we are checking in and giving you play-by-play, but I think big big plays are in play here, and we will check into the game periodically. As We'll probably be on here for a majority of the rest of this game. But this week, man, I think you can agree, was one of the craziest weeks in terms of sports news that we've had in quite a while. And I'm specifically talking about Wednesday, which seemed like it was hit after hit after hit. Yeah, a lot of coaching changes, and I saw someone list all of them off and sort of saying it's the end of an era, man. And not just Saban, but when you, you know, couple Saban with Belichick and Pete Carroll, um, you know, it's just kind of, it is, it makes you look back, you know, like someone like myself, I'm like, dang, man, I'm, I am officially getting old (laughs) and the NFL uh, college, whatever football, as we know, it is really turning a big page here because we're moving forward into the 12 team playoff era. And we're going to have a lot of new faces um, in places that we've never seen before, or haven't seen for a long time. So uh, definitely tons of change. I think I saw that this is the first playoff since the 98-99 season that Peyton Manning and or Tom Brady has not been a part of it. So this is the wow. end of an era in a lot of different ways. Think about that for a second. Now, don't forget that Peyton Manning was drafted a little before Tom Brady was, so their careers have spanned this large, large, massive time. But to have them consistently in the playoffs for that many years is pretty remarkable. But I think when you talked about the end of an era, like sometimes we get a little hyperbolic when we do these types of things and we get sports radio E and we talk about that stuff. But to think about Pete Carroll was the first domino. Like there's been other coaching changes. I don't want to diminish the other coaching changes. And we're going to get to some of those as we go along here. But I think when you think about Pete Carroll, it was like, wow, that seems so abrupt. It seems so sudden because the day before he had said, I plan on coaching this team next year. And the language that was used when they announced it to me made it feel like it was a forceful outing that he wanted to stay there, that the Seahawks were ready to move on, which by the way, when we were on on Monday for the national championship game and our Pacific Northwest friend was on, we talked about that, right? We talked about the fact that they maybe need to turn the clock a little bit. And then that seems big enough And as I'm cooking dinner, 
I open ESPN and there it is. Nick Saban is retiring from the University of Alabama. Okay, so like for me, and I don't know how you took this news, but it's like I knew that someday Nick Saban wasn't going to coach the team, but this is a team that just went to the playoff. And to have it happen in such a way that there was no whispers, usually you hear rumors, and it was as if he decided an hour before that he was going to do that. And that's why I think it was so sudden and shocking to me in a world now that feels less and less shocking by the day. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. But I, I have a lot of respect for Nick Saban and how he handled this situation because he, I think he made sure that it wasn't about him. You know, it wasn't one of these, you know, we've seen these sort of victory victory lap deals where someone's like, this is going to be my last season. Um, and it's like it's brought up every week. And uh, that we, we've seen scenarios where it's, spec, you know, we get years of speculation before they finally retire, retiring, unretiring, which it's yet to be seen, but I don't think he's going to come out of retirement. Um, and then also him keeping it hush-hush until after, the transfer portal and all that stuff closed. Now, granted, it opens up for 30 days with the coaching change. But I think he allowed there to be some, you know, and after signing day, really, probably more or less, and allowed there to be some stability um, to the recruiting class and the recruiting situation moving forward. And and maybe it was a matter of him waiting until they had a good idea of what direction that they wanted to go in moving forward. Yeah. But, you know, I... In hindsight, I'm not that surprised, but I know when, you know, any other time we've talked about it, we've we've said that, you know, we think that he's still got some something left in the tank. But I think there's something to be said for retiring before you have exhausted it all, you know. Sure. So sure. And he's done that. I can't disagree with you about how he handled it. The only weird part is that he was rumored to have been interviewing coaches earlier that day. Like there were three coaches that flew in. And I can understand the awkwardness of not wanting to be one of those three coaches that were outed because it's like a storyline in a way. But at the same time, the, he had to have known this was going to be in play. I can't imagine that the news dropped the day that it dropped without there being some purpose behind it. And I think you're absolutely right that he is the kind of guy who is going to go out with the dignity of, number one, treating the university with the utmost respect. Because let's be fair. They've paid him millions and millions of dollars, and he, in hand, has made them millions and millions of dollars. So I can understand that. 17 years, six national championships. And you're right. The recruiting trail is the important part because every time coaches leave as soon as they can so that they can start on the trail for whatever school they're going to go to. So Nick Saban is no longer the coach at Alabama. This is not one of those Tom Brady things. He's not coming out of retirement. He's done. And the University of Alabama very swiftly hired their next coach, and that was Kalen DeBoer from Washington. Now, I understand the hire. I understand why he wants the job. I personally am completely uninspired by the hire. I agree. Um, and to be, I don't know this for a fact, but I feel like there is a very good chance uh, that he was the fourth or fifth, fourth or fifth person offered the job. I think that this job was likely offered to. Sark, I think it was probably offered to Dan Lanning. I think it was, I think they probably called Lane Kiffin, and it wouldn't shock me if they called Mike Norvell. Uh, he's the one that maybe I'm the least sure about uh, that a phone call was made to. But, I mean, I think that's what makes it so meh. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's coming off and you know, taking Washington into a national title game, but it does. It feels very meh because... I think that most people assume that it wasn't their first choice. You may be right about that. And I think I'm uninspired because this is a guy who clearly can coach. But he coached a team that had a Heisman Trophy finalist on it that was a transfer. Or excuse me, a transfer. He did not recruit Michael Penix in the old-fashioned way, right? So transfer portals are a little bit different and also with NIL and everything. And he doesn't have a pedigree of winning in the toughest position. So the Pac-12 was, up until this season, seen as an inferior conference, top to bottom. I think you could agree with that, right? Oh, 100%. And, and his, I kind of looked at his resume earlier, and it, there's not a, there aren't a lot of impressive stops along the way. Um, you know, he was a high school coach for a while. He was 
Um, the offensive coordinator at Southern Illinois, his four, first Division One like FBS job was Eastern Michigan. But then it, literally it's like one year, one year, like two. I want to say as long as stop anywhere was maybe like three years. And I don't think that might have been like Fresno State possible, or maybe that yeah, was a one and done. That was a one and done, wasn't either it? Way. Um, I mean, but it's just been so brief, you know, and he's like you said, he's never had to to build anything. And so, yeah, Alabama to some degree recruits itself, but you still got to put the work in. I mean, this thing is not on cruise control. Uh, you've got to be able to steer the ship. Didn't Alabama recruit itself because of Nick Saban? Because before yes. he got there, Alabama did not recruit itself. And my question, though, is, is this it? Is this the way that it went down? You talked about it being the fourth or fifth choice. So think about it this way. Dan Lanning went on social media and made a video about how he wasn't taking the job, which is the antithesis of his entire speech to his team before they played Colorado. But I digress. Mike Norvell essentially did the same thing. Sark essentially the same thing. And for these guys who are at the highest pinnacle of their particular sport right now to come out and so overtly say that they're not taking this job. What that tells me is that they understand what we have talked about since this happened, that who would want this job? Despite this being the premier job, who would want to take over after Nick Saban? I think it right now is a resounding not many people at the top of Alabama's list. Yeah, I and mean, if you look at the other people that we speculate were contacted about this job, they are at what we could say are programs that are on the rise that are ascending that have you know these coaches have built up those programs and they're moving in the right direction you know Kalen DeBoer I mean he might have just kind of caught lightning in a bottle and so I understand fully why he took the job because with Washington going to the Big Ten not that the SEC I mean the SEC is the best conference in the country typically year in and year out but he knows probably how hard there's Washington has been good in the past but like they've got a perennial power and there's got to be reasons why that is. And he, yeah, he's shown that with the right talent and the right staff that you can get to a national title game. He probably knew that if he stayed at Washington, that he was going to have an uphill battle to match what they did this year. I agree. And he could have easily been fired in a couple of years. Now he could still be fired from Alabama in a couple of years, which plays into what you're saying. Who wants to be the guy to replace a legend? You're better off being the guy who replaces the guy yes. uh, that follows the legend. By the way, did you see the caller into the Paul Feinbaum show? I sent you that a little earlier today. I didn't send you the clip, but the clip was hilarious. But essentially what happened is an Alabama fan called the Paul Feinbaum show and said that Nick Saban was a Yankee because he was from West Virginia and Alabama's done, hired another Yankee. I could not stop laughing when I saw that because, my goodness, that other Yankee, by the way, won you six national championships. Put some respect on his name. Yeah, no kidding. And it, it does go to show you just – sort of the uh um the mindset of uh not everybody but a percentage of folks who live in the south and kind of the way that they they view the world but yeah I, it's kind of silly but not surprised i mean and really that's what if you are hosting a a talk radio show and you're going to have callers you don't want someone that's rational no and uh no i mean because that's not you know, that's not going to get anybody's attention. You Absolutely want the crazy. Not. You want the crazies, and he gets them in droves. That call screener had to have been jerking off, being like, we've got to put this guy <laughs> yes. on. T yes. We've got to put this guy on here, especially for Paul Feinbaum, which is amazing, because I don't think of Paul Feinbaum as entertaining radio, if that makes sense. He just seems very Paul Feinbaum. I don't know. That's what he feels like to me, just very bleh. Yo, absolutely. It, well, and he's a curmudgeon. Yeah, I, he's a curmudgeon. He, he loves the SEC, and um, it, it's – but again, even when it comes to hosts, and, and this may be part of our struggles, I, we're not incredibly polarizing people. No. Uh, we, we are um, – we, we tend to be pretty rational and maybe be able to see both sides of things in different situations, and a lot of your big time, uh, whether it's news, sports, politics, whatever, is they are very um, – very opinionated, full of conviction, uh, intensely in support of whatever their ideas are, whatever their side of things. They always pick a side 100% and go all in on it, and that it's polarizing, and that's what people like. So the narrative now around Nick Saban, some of it anyway, is that he knew also that not only was the job getting harder at his age, but the landscape is completely changing for college football. 
And he's probably looking at the success that he has had and how hard this year was. And he's on record as saying this is one of his most challenging years, despite the fact that he had a team that everybody didn't believe in that won the SEC and was a couple plays away from being in the national championship against the eventual title winner. And Nick Saban is probably like, you know, maybe this is the time to get out. And you could argue that he's technically going out on top. He didn't go out with a national championship, but to have made the playoff and not had his program take such a downturn that he had to step away, this probably was the right time. And people are saying that as a negative, and I'm thinking a lot of the greats don't have the ability or foresight to say that, and they usually stay around way too long, which is kind of what happened in New England, you could make an argument. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I also think there's something to be said for the fact that Nick Saban's made it very known that he doesn't necessarily agree with the the direction that college football is, is headed in and, you know, things like the transfer portal and NIL specifically. And um and I, I think that he just realizes that he's not wired to operate in the in the system as it's it appears to be evolving. Uh, the direction that appears to be moving in. So I, I I think that plays a lot into it, honestly, just that you have to, you know, I think Alabama was able to build their success by you could sell kids on, hey, you can come here. You're basically going to sit on the bench for two to three years. You're going to get your one year in the sun, and then you're going to be highly successful, win a national championship, or at least compete for one, then go off to the NFL and make millions and millions of dollars. And you could sell kids on that. Now kids aren't willing to go be a backup at Alabama for a couple of years because they can get paid to go be a starter somewhere else. Yes, and I think what's happening too, and Coach Prime kind of pulled the curtain back on this a little bit, how before Nick Saban or whoever was his people who went recruiting, right, would go to the recruit's house or meet them and give them the spiel about the campus and all these different things. And now I feel like a lot of the recruits are saying, yeah, that's nice, but you haven't gotten to the point of, what I'm going to be compensated for, for coming here. And that is part of the changing tide. I know that people are kind of polarized on that, but it is what it is. This is where we are in college football. It's where we're headed. And next year, too, for them, an expanded playoff technically makes it harder for Nick Saban because more teams have a chance now. You have to win more games, and it's not just a guarantee that, well, if we're consistently in the top four that we have a shot for the national title. It's not the same anymore. And I think that he's making the right decision, and he did it the right way. And Alabama just is going to have to, was always going to have to deal with the fact that Nick Saban was going to retire or whatever. They were going to fire him. I just feel really bad for Kalen DeBoer because I feel like in three years when we're still doing this show, we're going to be like, and Alabama is searching for a new head coach. And that's the guy who's probably going to be the successful guy because now he comes after somebody who followed Nick Saban, didn't do well, and then now comes in and says, I can resurrect the program. That's why I think the advantageous position you want to be in, not the, wow, I got to follow this guy. But at least to Saban's credit, he's not going to be like in the face of the coach or anything like that. Like he seems like he's going to be completely out of it unless asked for his opinion, which I think is a great thing. No, I think so too. And I think it's, it's very nice of him, professional of him to do what he's doing as far as off, you know, saying that we're here and I'm fully uh, supportive of, of, you know, Coach DeBoer and, and his family and uh, why they go through this process and anything they need along the way. And I think that's great. Um, I think we're starting to see kind of like who Nick Saban the person is a little bit. And I think we've started to see that over the last year or two. It's kind of come out more more and more, just kind of what his character is like. And, and I think in, in sports, people are so quick to judge and to dislike people simply because they coach a team you don't like or uh, their rival, whatever. But and there are there's some bad guys out there. There's bad people in every profession. But he seems like a pretty solid guy. And maybe Kalen DeBoer is Mike Tomlin. You know, just replaces a a really good coach that had a lot of success and comes in and just keeps it rolling for the most part. It's possible, but I I don't know if are, are the expectations that high in the pros. I mean, I know that they are, and we're going to get to that in a sec, but like in college, there's such an emotional connection to your team in a way that is so different, and the boosters are way different. There are not people in the NFL who are going to come in and cut a check just so you can fire a guy, whereas that will happen, and it especially happens at these 
these schools like Alabama where or a Texas a and or Michigan or whatever. And I think that there's more of a chance of something like that happening than in Mike Tomlin's case where you can go in. Now, he, Mike Tomlin also inherited Ben Roethlisberger. That helps tremendously. and But he's continued to show that he can win. So you may be right. And I'm not rooting for DeBoer to have a bad stint at Alabama. History has just shown that when you are that guy, it's nearly impossible to succeed. But the groundwork is laid for him to succeed because of what he's taking over. He's not taking over a program that's on the downturn. They're still at high heights. And so far, they've only had, what, one kid enter the portal? That's a good sign. That is a good sign. And th- there's this creates a lot more questions, though. Like, I think I asked you or whatever, like, what happens to Tommy Reese? Yes. Uh, with Kalen DeBoer being an offensive guy. Um, I think there's a there's an offensive coordinator opening at LSU. I know that. Yes. Um, so I would say that's a possibility. But I think that also if there's a um, group of five or a maybe a bottom of their conference power five team that's looking for a head coach, he may be ready to take that step. Or maybe there's an opportunity in the NFL um, as a coordinator that presents uh, presents itself. And then as Washington. Has there been any speculation about what direction Washington's going to move in? No, I don't think so. But I, from what I understand, the rumblings are that they want to hire internally and they want to promote their offensive coordinator, who obviously was a big part of how they got to where they got to because he was the play caller. So I, I think if you're going to give anybody the credit for what happened last year that's internal, you could go that direction. Not to mention a lot of the biggest names that you would want to try and go for necessarily are they're where they are. You know what I mean? Like, I think people kind of are where they are with the jobs that are there. And it's all of this is fascinating to me. And next year will be one of the more fascinating years in college football because of all the changes from Saban being off the sideline to the expanded playoff, another year of the transfer portal. There's so many things to look forward to. And this college football season, as we're wrapping it up now, we forgot to mention that Michigan won the national title, but that's not really newsworthy because I think that's the, what, what they did was they dominated that game, and we were on here on Monday, so everybody knows our opinions on that. And the landscape is different now, but I'm looking forward to next season, and it's just it's kind of sad that we have to close the book on college, though, for a little bit. Yeah, it, definitely as far as it being uh, what's consumed or what consumes most of this show, but there'll be a few more things. You know, what's Harbaugh going to do? Uh, then again, that if you know he leaves for the NFL, that opens up that job, which that job, I, I think there's really only two ways they could go. Um, that is promote Tron Moore, or there's been, you know, Brian Kelly's been attached to that job, which is interesting. Um, there's no you know, way. I think that no way I, it's, it's been talked about a lot, man, no by way. like, by like mainstream people, um, very, people way more popular than us. Hold, hold, and, hold, 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 uh, yeah, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. All right. Are you telling me that he just left Notre Dame? to go to LSU, and then he's going to jump ship to go to Michigan. Like, this seems ridiculous to me. I'm not saying he's that it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's something it's been tossed out there as something that people think is a legitimate possibility and something that he would be, uh, that he would entertain if the opportunity presented itself. So this is fascinating to me because I was thinking about this today. This is totally off topic, but about what the most coveted jobs in college football are. And I actually had Michigan in that top five. Do you disagree? I don't. I don't disagree. No. Because I was thinking about Sark, right? Sark's at Texas. I thought that was a top five job. Alabama's yeah. obviously a top five job. I would consider Notre Dame a top five job just because of the notoriety of being at Notre Dame with everything that comes with it is a coveted job. I mean, Brian Kelly was at that job for what? Like 12 seasons or whatever it was? Yeah, so, yeah he was there for a long time. Long time. He's their all-time wins leader now. Yeah. So then Michigan, I think, is in there. And so what would round out the top five? You know what I mean? Like, what is Georgia right now? Uh, is that really what LSU could be considered the, that five? LSU is certainly in the top ten. Yes. Um, I think if they round out the top five, I think you'd have to say Texas. Well, I did say that. Texas. Um, did you say Texas? Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, some might argue USC. Yeah, that could be another one, too. But, yeah. man, it's tough. That's Ohio, what I mean. So Ohio like, State. Yeah, Ohio State. So, like, LSU is hanging out in that area of, what, top eight jobs? So, is moving from LSU to Michigan that much of a jump when LSU and their education standards have to be so much lower than Michigan? 
And why would you want the headache, right? So why, why would you want that headache? Brian Kelly just had that at Notre Dame. He could stay at LSU and pretty much like slum it up it academically and get the best players and win. But you might be onto something because Brian Kelly now is in two seasons in, and while it's nice that he's won ten games, the what three previous coaches have won a national title. You gotta be you gotta be thinking that the boosters are like, hey man, it's gotta happen soon here because Caleb. De- I mean, Kalen DeBoer is gonna go through the same thing. He's got what three four years to win a national title at best, maybe. Yeah, at best. Uh, I mean, it depends on how poorly the season goes if they aren't in serious contention. And with yeah, with Brian Kelly, I gotta imagine the Sharks are circling. Yes, and he, you know, and by by everyone else's standards, pretty much nearly across the country, he's been highly successful there. But yeah. he's yet to do what you know. They the bar's set high. There's nothing wrong with setting the bar high. No. Um, and he knew that when he took that job. Yes. Uh, I'm sure that. I mean, it's proven to be more difficult maybe than he he initially expected, perhaps. But you know, the one thing though that I do, I don't want to say I mean that I like about it, I guess, is that a lot of the excuses that he used to throw out there when he was at Notre Dame, like those aren't excuses anymore, you know. And so now, why now? If you if you don't get it done now, why not? And ten wins and a Heisman winner is nothing to sneeze at. Just about every other coach in big-time college football would take that success. And a lot of fan bases would take that success. But sorry, it just it hit me when you said Brian Kelly's connected with that job. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Because nope. what's what's enough for this guy? And I, I don't like Brian Kelly personally. I understand that he's a good football coach. I think that's obvious. But my goodness, loyalty means nothing to this guy because he really wasn't that loyal to Notre Dame. He only stayed there because he wasn't asked to take another better job. And as soon as that other better job came along, gone. Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. And, uh, and, I mean, he along the way, like Mike Denbrock, that they're just, you know, that he hired at LSU that just came back to Notre Dame. I mean, he fired Mike Denbrock because if he didn't, he was basically going to lose his job. And so he had to fire, which there are coaches that get put in that position. So that's not necessarily an indictment on Brian Kelly's character. Um but, I mean, that's just part of the business. He doesn't of, uh, think twice about that, though. No, I mean, he doesn't did lose a wink of sleep over it. No, <laughs> he doesn't opinion. stand up and say, I'm not doing that. I'm taking a moral stand. He's like, you got it. I'm going to go do it right now. Yeah. Doesn't right. matter if it's Christmas Day. Doesn't matter. He'll do it. Does, he'll, have, he'll do it. So let's move on to the NFL. And the other big news was Bill Belichick, which I have to say wasn't surprising at all. Like, we've been talking about that for a couple of months, actually almost like half the season. It became official. They had a press conference and everything. And so the Bill Belichick, Tom Brady era is officially over. 24 years he was there and lots of winning. Six Super Bowls, obviously. The last few years had not been good. And now everybody wants to pile on and say, look at what he did to Brady at the end. He didn't respect him. And now Bob Kraft and all this relationship and and everything. And it's like, look, 24 years for the same people to be running an organization successfully is something that doesn't happen in sports too often. And they're like marriages. Normally, there are ebbs and flows in any type of relationship, but we have not seen this kind of stability in organization outside of the Steelers for a while. And eventually, it's going to end. I don't know why people are so surprised, like, oh, my goodness, this is the changing of the guard. And in some ways, it is. But the changing of the guard happened when Belichick and Brady weren't there together. That was the the marquee. And it's eventually, you're an 80-something-year-old owner in Bob Kraft. You haven't won anything in a while outside of – they did win a Super Bowl within the last five years, so I will say that. But, like, I'm not surprised that this ended and that Bill Belichick has the ego to think, I can coach again, and Bob Kraft has the ego to say, I can find somebody who can win. Jerry Jones did that with Jimmy Johnson after only, like, a handful of seasons, right? They did a lot of winning, but the egos come into play – and while it's it's sad from a fan perspective, from a business perspective, I'm not surprised. I don't know why this is, I mean, I get why it's news, but I don't understand why people are so like, oh my God, about this. We all knew this was coming, or you just aren't paying attention. Yeah, I think the only question was in what sort of way was it going to unfold, right? Because there right. was speculation, would he be traded? You know, we didn't know if he would, I don't think we thought he would retire. 
But, yeah. you know, would he resign on his own? Would, would And I think they did the right thing to where everybody can sort of save face. A mutual parting of ways. Absolutely. Uh, you know, very amicably, it appears. So I I just, every like you said, everybody knew this was coming. It, it didn't, if it, like, <laughs> if it caught you by surprise, like then that. you weren't paying attention. Yeah, you weren't paying attention to anything at all. I'm curious to see where he lands, though. Yes. There's, uh, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of, of interesting jobs. possibilities. Yes. Yeah, there's yes. a lot of interesting possibilities that you have teams that are pretty well. I I don't think he's going to go anywhere where he's going to have to like rebuild. No, because that'd um, be like going. To he's going to go somewhere with Yeah, he's going to go somewhere where the rosters pretty well put together and ready to win now. And I think I mean there's a couple of those places we can get into at some point whenever you want to. But yep. um, no, it's it's not. It's a, it's a sad day because it's it's the end of an era, but. I think Bill Belichick would even admit to you that it was just time for a change for everybody. It was time for a fresh start. I do think, though, that he he wanted to leave but also didn't want to leave because I think from his perspective, it was frustrating that his owner didn't still have his back the way that he did for all of those years. But throughout all of those years, his quarterback was Tom Brady, and they were consistently winning and in contention for a Super Bowl. That makes it a lot easier. But then Belichick tries to do the hard thing. He tries to move on from Brady a couple of times, and that's when the power struggle starts. And when Brady left, many people thought Bill was dumb. But there's how many quarterbacks in history that have done what Tom Brady has done? Zero, outside of Tom Brady. And so for Belichick to try to move on from him at age 42, what else was the guy supposed to do? Like, and then he wins the Super Bowl. But how many people had Tom Brady playing at that level, right? You know, at his age when you project ten years ago. But also the Bucks had to get so many guys on that roster. And I think Tom would have looked the same way that he did his last year in New England had the Bucks not gone out and gotten all of those pieces, because that's how you make an aging quarterback look younger. So it's like, look, they needed each other. It is what it is. Bill tried to move on. And he made a lot of dumb mistakes as the GM the last few years. He has to own that. And if he wants that kind of control somewhere else, then I think the same thing is going to happen. So if you're a franchise, you've got to be careful because he doesn't just show up and get you in the Super Bowl by just appearing in the door. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think he he sort of fell victim to his own success. And by that, I mean he found the diamond in the rough a few times and really started to to buy into his ability to do that and it was almost like he got a little cute you know I yes. mean, as far as trying to put together put a team on the field or find talent and people that nobody else saw find cheap talent bargain talent if you want to call it that bargain, ben, I like that. <laughs> bargain talent and uh and try to outsmart everybody and you know yeah that works when you have a all-time quarterback absolutely Um, that that covers up a lot of uh, a lot of mistakes but when that guy's gone that lack of talent that is left becomes very obvious yes I totally agree with you so the Patriots moved on by hiring Gerard Mayo the day after the press conference and what I've come to learn is that it was written into his contract that he would be the successor now I asked you did Bill know because in my mind, if Bill didn't know, that's kind of nuts, isn't it? Yeah, it's really shady, I think, if he didn't know that. And I found that really interesting because you wonder, at one point in time, I think people believe that Josh McDaniels had uh, some something set up along those lines, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, and he probably moved on from that years ago when he, you know, took the Raiders job and stuff. But uh, it super interesting. And, I mean... Does anyone know how long, like, when was this contract put into place even? Well, I don't know how long Gerard Mayo has been on the staff. Now, he was a player drafted by the Patriots, spent his entire professional career playing and coaching on the Patriots roster or on their staff. So it makes sense. But it's interesting that it's written into the contract. And what that tells me is that whenever they signed this, which I feel like has to have been since Brady left, Bob Kraft kind of already knew that he was going to move on from Belichick at some point. This was kind of one of those fail-safes, in case of an emergency break glass kind of thing. It's great for Gerard Mayo, 
like awesome for Gerard Mayo. And I'm happy for the guy. And I also think it's great that Bob Kraft immediately hired a minority candidate without any interviews. That's awesome, right? I mean, so checkpoints for the Patriots on that one because who had Boston sports doing that in that way? Not nobody. And I think that Gerard Mayo is a good candidate in the sense that he is a guy who is well-liked by the players in that team because a lot of reports the last two years have been there's been a lot of turmoil and a lot of uncertainty and sort of us versus them on this roster. And so maybe, just maybe, this is one of those addition by subtraction things, but Gerard Mayo has only been a defensive coordinator for a small amount of time, never been a head coach. And I think now in today's league, defensive-minded guys who become head coaches aren't as successful. And that's the only thing that worries me. But again, you're following you're following Bill Belichick. So your your task is almost impossible. Yeah. I- Fortunately, he's in a different situation a little bit than Kalen DeBoer because, one, he's been he's on staff, uh, so he's got the relationships. He understands sort of the lay of the land there in New England. And the Patriots haven't been very good for a couple of years. So he the bar isn't set nearly as high as it is at, at Alabama. The expectations aren't what they are. So I think that works in his favor for sure. And... And he'll, I think he'll get time too. I think, but I also think that I think the so NFL, too. I think the NFL has proven out of all the sports leagues, the one that you can, um, you can build and get good the fastest in the NFL than you can, um, and, you know, in, in other professional sports. Yeah. It is possible that he will be successful right away because they are in an advantageous position. And I do want to get into this in the off season. Something Coach and I have been talking about offline is getting a little bit more into individual teams for a lot of the people that tune into the show who maybe want to know a little bit more from us about their teams. Now, we should be very, very out front that we are not knowledgeable in every single team in the NFL. So our analysis could be completely ignorant. But actually, that's what makes great content. So I feel like, hey, we're going to try that. But I think if you were looking at the Patriots now, it's like we have the number three pick in the draft. We have a new head coach. We're starting over, and they can get a quarterback now and start over and try and start with a brand-new slate without any of the expectations of Tom Brady or Bill Belichick or anything like that. And I think you're right. Bob Kraft will give him time, I think, because I think Bob Kraft, though, moved on from Belichick because he's looking at himself in his 80s and thinking, I need to win another one. Because I think he liked being the owner that had Tom Brady and Belichick, and it was awesome, and now it's like, we're four and thirteen. It's not that much more. It's not that fun to go into owners' meetings anymore. Yeah, he's not the big dog on the block anymore. And uh, but this would get him back there. You know, if he can. You know, what's to say about Bob Kraft? You know, if uh, he can get the Patriots back to a championship level without Belichick or Brady. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that'd that's be a what nice he wants. feather in his cap. But yeah. That's what he wants, right? And that's the thing is, all three of these guys, Kraft, Belichick, and Brady, all want to be recognized for their parts in this. And what made it all work, and I will say this until I die, is that Brady and Belichick had to be together for this to work. And Brady spoke to that this week. I wouldn't be the player I ended up being without Bill Belichick. They came together at the right time, and so many things happened. If it hadn't happened that way, Tom Brady would have probably been selling insurance, and Bill Belichick might have been fired, right? And that's how it kind of happens. But the Boston area is really fortunate. I don't think they have a clue, but think about it this way, man. Over the course of Boston sports for the last 100 years, they had Red Auerbeck and Bill Russell, who won what? Like 11 championships or something stupid like that. And Brady and Belichick, in the salary cap era, win six Super Bowls. We should consider ourselves fortunate that we have had two dynamic duos of that stature that are at the top of the sport for all time. Some cities have never even had one person that they would consider that. And I'm looking at like Bears and Browns, Jets, Lions, like so many cities would kill for something like that. So Boston Sports, if you are watching or listening, have some damn gratitude, will you? Well, just think about I'm trying to think of like a number, maybe 30 years old. You're a 30 year old Boston sports fan. You you were right there, you know, throughout the Patriots dynasty like as a kid growing up where you probably like this is just how it always is Patriots dynasty the Red Sox um, with their championships the 
Uh, you know, the Celtics, well, the Celtics have been a little up and down, I guess, but you know, they've been mostly pretty damn good. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, the Bruins have been good. Yep. And so it's like, the, it is a, uh, it is an embarrassment of riches or whatever, yeah. you know, with the, what the level of championship play that has been happening in the Boston area over the last you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah, I can't stand it. Like anybody who was born in the, in the 2000s, if you were born in 2000 to now, you have seen nothing but success. And I think what comes with that is many of those fans are obnoxious and they're the loudest people in the room when they represent Boston sports. It drives me nuts. I have a little bit of the humility because I saw the bad times. And you know what it was about for me? It's about watching the games with my dad. Like, that's all yeah. it was about. And I remember those moments of superstition where we'd be watching a game and something bad would happen. And dad would be like, hey, man, we got to switch seats because, you know, we got to get some good mojo. And like, those are the things I remember. The winning when it started. And I said this when I went live the other night about Belichick briefly. I said that first Super Bowl, the feeling of winning it. I'll never forget that. It was so pure because it was so unexpected. And I never forgot that. Even after all the other wins, I never forgot how it felt because, again, there are fan bases who have never, ever felt it. And I just get really soapboxy when we talk about this because Boston sports, the fans, the obnoxious ones, really, really piss me off because they don't even know how good they've had it. And this is just a blip in the radar for them over the last the century. This is the first time we're going for a coach this century. That never happens. Yeah, I mean, could you imagine a a Boston sports fan, you know, a Patriots fan, whatever, complaining to um, a Cleveland sports fan? Yes, I can like hear that. it. I they mean, would do it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just crazy, you know. I mean, there are a lot of other fan bases, nearly any other fan base that would would trade whatever success they've had for the success of Boston sports over the last, you know, 20 to 30 years. You know, you're right, though, man. Like, it is about those memories that are tied to the experience, you know. And, like, gosh, I mean, there's times, you know, that I think, I don't know, last year or two years ago for a while, uh, you know, me and my dad stopped watching the Bradley Road games in the same room because it's like anytime we'd watch them together on the TV, they would lose. And so, like, we would not watch them in the same room together or the couple times we attempt to and it'd start going bad and, like, he'd leave and go to his room and uh and then things would turn around and so it's just so silly but um but though yeah those are the things you think about those are the best things in sports so a couple of other coaches got fired we talked about Pete Carroll now i think Pete Carroll and Mike Vrabel are kind of in the same boat for for the same reasons but sort of different Pete Carroll is 72 same age as Bill Belichick he's up there and he doesn't seem that old because he's very energetic on the sidelines seems like he's got a ton of juice left but the Seahawks, I think, were looking at this and thinking over the past few seasons, the defense has not been very good. The team has been mediocre. And while the players like this guy, maybe his style and everything just doesn't work for what they need to do to get back to where that they were. And while it kind of seemed like it was mutual, again, the language that was used made me think that the Seahawks said, look, Pete, I know you're okay to coach. I know you want to coach. We're going a different direction. This wasn't painted the same way as the Belichick thing. There was no mutual press conference. Pete had a press conference by himself to talk about this. So I think Pete is out for those reasons. And I don't disagree with the move necessarily, but Pete Carroll, going back, we haven't done an Iceman stat of the week for a while, but he is one of three coaches to win a national championship and a Super Bowl. Do you know the other two? Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Johnson. Correct. Uh was it Barry Switzer? Yes, right? correct. I thought there was another one. Was it, is it only three? It is only three from at least the stats that I was looking at that were posted everywhere after okay. Pete Carroll. But think about that. A lot of people forget that about Pete Carroll. And I know that USC, the way he left and all that, and say what you want to say about it, but he was successful at USC and parlayed that into success in the NFL. And only three guys have done that to that level is pretty impressive. But he doesn't get the accolades that everybody does because he's not Belichick, didn't win six Super Bowls, went to two, won one, and that's pretty impressive. Belichick didn't coach in college, didn't win a national championship. Nick Saban didn't do it. Nick Saban was a failure in Miami. So Pete Carroll deserves some flowers. Mike Vrabel getting fired, a lot of people thought that was surprising. The Titans have been terrible the last couple of years, terrible quarterback situation. 
rumored that Mike Vrabel wanted roster control, was denied roster control. It sounded like ownership just got tired of the guy. And while people in New England wanted Mike as their coach, I have said that I'm not sure he was a good fit because he is the Belichick kind of guy, hard-nosed guy. I, I don't think that that works as much when you don't come with the accolades. And Mike Vrabel just doesn't have the pedigree and the winning. And so I think that's why he's out in Tennessee. I don't think it works in the NFL as much today. And so I don't think going from Belichick to Vrabel would have been like this big change for the Patriots. But I can see him landing somewhere else. Yeah, okay, that's fair. I see what you're saying. I think that Mike Vrabel appears to be a good coach. Yeah, he is. Um, yeah, for sure. And they've had success. I think that, you know, moving moving forward in the NFL, I'm thinking, you know, are there, you know, we exist in a world right now where you have Mike McDaniel and you have Bill Belichick. Are there two more polar opposite types of humans that you could think about, you know, and then they're both existing in this world. They have the same job, right? And I think that the future is moving more in the direction you're going to see more Mike McDaniels or even Kyle Shanahan's, Sean McVay's and Matt LaFleur's, you know, these guys, they don't seem like they're these hard asses by any means. Um, you know, they obviously have leadership skills or they wouldn't be in the position that they're in, but it, it seems like it's way more about what you know from a, schematic perspective and things like that than it is not that bill i mean belichick's an expert but just that old school mentality is kind of uh uh, seems like it's fading into the past yeah it is and all of this is signifying a change coming in this again like this is not something that it was like the era ended in phases it was like we just lopped it off and decided this is the end of it yeah, And so we're kind of going forward in that. But the other rumors that are happening are interesting, and I want to pose a question to you about it. So rumors are that Nick Sirianni could be fired if the Eagles lose this weekend to the Bucks, And Harbaugh, obviously, after winning a national title, considering going to the NFL. And I told you that I think I would do that if I were him because I think he wants to win a Super Bowl. I think it's obvious that in his own household, he still is a rung below his brother because he's won a national title, but... That gets him a seat at the table, not at the head of the table. I think that's more family dynamics. But with Sirianni, think about this. Like, you don't get to dictate anything anymore with what you've done because Sirianni went to the Super Bowl last year, and now they've struggled this year, and it's like we could think about making a change. That's kind of insane to me, a little bit insane to me because, like, things are different than they were last year. And again, Belichick moves on. Teams are just willing to move on from guys. Doesn't matter. Many people would say that like Belichick should have gotten to go out the way he wanted. We, For all intents and purposes, he is. Like We don't know that. Pete Carroll, I think, is not. And a lot of people are like stunned that these guys don't get the chance to do that. They've earned that right. And I'm like, the NFL is a business. And it's obvious now that these franchises want to win. And if Nick Sirianni's job isn't safe after making a Super Bowl last year, nobody's job is safe. No, you're right. And sometimes it's just a matter of uh, of who's available. You know, that dictates your decision-making. Yeah. I maybe. remember when, and I can't, goodness, I can't remember the gentleman's name who was the Cubs manager when uh, they fired him to bring in Joe Madden. I mean, he had uh, he'd only been there a year or two. Uh, Renteria, maybe? Yeah, maybe. His last name. Uh, Rick Renteria, Ricky Renteria. Anyways. He was good. I mean, they were they were doing well, and Joe Madden became became available. Yes, and that was it, man. Like, I can get out of here, guy. Like, <laughs> um, and when Bill Belichick becomes available, and you're, there are certain franchises that are more desperate than others. Yes, uh, for a championship, or just to be playing in a championship caliber, and Philadelphia is one of them. And so it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. And there have been a lot of question marks, you know, because, uh, you know, he's, you know, I think I see that clip, I think it was a cowherd was talking about, you know, are there are other great, there are other coaches, successful coaches who have lost coordinators and it's never seemed to phase them one bit. You know, they just keep on rolling. Um, Saban. It's, you know, so, yeah, right. And I mean, even, you know, Andy Reid, yep. uh, McVay, Shannon, whoever. And so, you know, he lost, um, Shane Steichen, right? Yeah. The, the Colts coach. Colts coach, that's and, right. After yeah. last week, and you couldn't remember it. Yes, now you know it. Know. Very good. I got it. Shane Steichen. You know, Shane Steichen of the Colts. And 
he seems to be they seem to be struggling on offense and there could be a, a number of reasons why that's the case but when you combine what seems to be a few steps backwards compared to last year and having a legendary coach like Bill Belichick available I think it creates the perfect storm for something like this to happen. Yes, I agree. But Sirianni's funny because he's one of those guys. McDaniels is kind of the same way, but lesser to an extent. Like Sirianni's shtick is cute when you're winning. But then when you're struggling, it's not as cool, right? It's not as cute, especially for that fan base. And the thing about the Eagles is last year, I, I maintained this last year, and we both intentionally – basically said that the Eagles weren't as good as we thought that they were just to piss off Philadelphia, but they were good. But I also said that they surprised a lot of teams and they weren't going to get that luxury this year. They had a lot of things happen. They started 10 and one, but the wheels fell off in a way that indicates to me that something happened internally with that team. Like I get that some guys have been hurt and whatnot, but it feels to me like it was team chemistry more than anything else. And when that stuff happens and losing continues, there's only one way that that points, and that points to the head coach. Because you're going to get rid of the coach before you get rid of the players. Now, the players could be the problem. Jalen Hurts was talking about guys being locked in and focused and all that. I don't know. But Sirianni's going to get the ax if that's the case. If, he, if they feel, ownership feels, that he has lost his team, he's gone. doesn't matter if he went to the Super Bowl. That's just the way that the NFL works. It's just insane to me that he was beloved last year. Oh, this guy, he represents Philadelphia this year. Get rid of him. Like, it's that quick. Yeah, depending on whatever it was that happened. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Goodness. Um, it Ooh. could be, it could be very, it could be very detrimental. That you, some stuff, some of that stuff that could happen internally is really hard to undo. And then, you know, obviously the people in the organization are aware of whatever that is that have kind of sent things awry. But I, I don't know, man, like it's, it does come down to things like culture. And I know some people don't like those words like culture and momentum and whatnot, but I, I think it means something. And you've got to have a connected group of people uh, to achieve a goal like winning a Super Bowl. Yes. And you've got to have all pieces of the puzzle you know, working towards that same goal and doing their part. And you get a couple bad apples in there and it could get ugly in a hurry. And it is the head coach's job to to keep things together. So our commenter here talks about Chicago fans, and we're not going to get into this particular incident, which had to do with the booing of Jerry Krause's wife at a game last night. Coach and I talked about that offline, but that's not that's not here or there. But I think it's a good segue because we talked about wanting to get into more personalized analysis of these teams. And I think right now there are two teams that are intriguing because of different scenarios. So let's start with the Chicago Bears based off of that comment. And the Bears, and you talked about moving on from coaches and such, I don't really understand what the Bears are doing at all in any way. And it's been like that for a while. But they decided to keep Matt Eberflus, their coach, but they fired everybody else, it seems which is a weird, odd move because you think if you have faith in the coach to get things done, you'd let him have his own staff. And then they're in they're number one on the draft list right now, right? They're on the clock. They have Justin Fields. The speculation is they don't know what to do with this guy, even though the team played really well heading into the latter part of the year. And the other mess is that Caleb Williams is rumored to have said to the Bears that they should trade the number one pick. The funny part for me about that is that he's assuming that they would take him at number one, which isn't even a guarantee. And it also tells me a lot of other things about Caleb Williams. But let's break down the Bears a little bit. First, the head coach. How do you even decide that you're going to keep the coach and fire everybody else? To me, that is a gross sign of mismanagement. Yeah, it's – and I get a from being from central Illinois uh, – I've got a front row seat to Bears fans and their reactions to these things. And I don't know if it's a it's it's a matter of organizationally they don't want to, they want to show that they're the type of group that's going to give a a coach the runway that he needs to to get this thing off the ground. Um or if you know cuz I think there are some organizations out there if you are too quick to pull the trigger on guys folks aren't going to want to come work for you, you know, cuz they're like I'm not I'm not going to get a chance the first sign of adversity I'm out the door. But just like you mentioned, like we talked about with 
Nick Sirianni. The, these organizations are in the business of winning. And it does seem puzzling when you see some of the decisions that the Bears have made um, from, you know, coaching hires, front office, just very bizarre. Even draft picks, you know, even back from when they drafted uh, Mitchell Trubisky, it was just like a big head scratcher, you know. And, and it's just, they're frustrated. The fans are extremely frustrated. And how the coach kept his job, I don't know if it was just the fact that they finished the year decently, decently enough for him to keep his job and, and that Justin Fields showed some flashes down the stretch that he's maybe starting to figure some things out. I have no clue. Uh, the question that I posed online last night was, you know, Bear, would Bears fans even want Caleb Williams at this point because of the things that he said and because of kind of what we saw from him on the field uh, in the second half of the season? And it seemed that the nearly universal consensus was no, they would not. Uh, that I don't think that people are sold on Justin Fields, but they certainly did not seem to want Caleb Williams. And, and I agree. I don't think they should either. Right. But Fields to me looked a lot better later in the season. And the weird part is they finally kind of got into a groove of, Hey, let's let this guy chuck the ball down the field. Let's let this guy run. Let's let him maximize his skill set. And you know who did that? The offensive coordinator, who, by the way, they fired. So they're going to bring in another offensive coordinator for Justin Fields. It doesn't make any sense unless they know that they're not going to move on or they're not going to keep him. So does he find a home somewhere else? And who do they draft if not Caleb Williams? I don't think they should draft Caleb Williams either because I think that in this crop of quarterback, there is not one, in my opinion, that stands out above the rest. I think they can make a solid choice of a lot of the guys that are on that board and be good. But I will say this, is that if you're going to draft Caleb Williams, you better be damn sure that he wants to be there. Because it seems like he's doing the Eli Manning thing where he doesn't want to go to a franchise he doesn't want to go to. And the commanders pick second. And I know he's kind of from here, but he doesn't seem like he wants to go here either. No, he wants to go to, you know, one of these franchises that appears to be uh, ready to win now or that has their shit together, and you can't blame the guy for that necessarily, but that's just not how this thing works. No, you're in the um, wrong profession. Yeah, and that's not how this thing works, and you're not really putting out uh, a great image of yourself when you start saying things like this. And and I don't know, maybe this is just where, where the world's headed, man, but I'm all about players having having a say and, ha and having control over their own careers, but when it comes to being, I mean, then you just pull to John Elway, I guess, man, and just don't sign, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and I, I don't know. It's, it's very weird. I don't have a very high opinion of Caleb Williams right now. Anyways, he it just, there wasn't a lot I saw from him for, from a character perspective that I found to be impressive. The guy's got skills, but even the way he plays the game, I think he plays selfishly. He didn't play within the system. You know, he wants to make those flashy plays that are, you know, are off schedule. But I think he takes a play that should be, should function as it's drawn up. And he intentionally takes it off schedule uh, to, to, like I said, to make some flashy play that'll show up on Sports Center. And my dad and I, I think we're talking about this. I don't think that that's, you know, these coaches in the NFL, they don't want that. Even, you know, do you think Andy Reid wants Patrick Mahomes running around? making some of these plays you see him make? No. Now, it's nice that he has that ability when he needs it, but they're not drawing that stuff up for yeah. him to do that. I mean, they would much rather him stand back there in the pocket and go through his progression and throw the ball. Um, now, when things do break down, that's a great skill to have, but you're not designing an offense um, around those things either. And Wait. so, go ahead. He's also earned that right, though. Like, He's not, he was not improvising that way right from the get go when he started games for the Chiefs. He has earned that over time. And Caleb Williams maybe has earned that with Lincoln Riley. I'm sure Lincoln Riley loved that stuff because, as we talked about and criticized Lincoln Riley for a while about his malpractice in essentially not having a defense, but having this great offense. And Caleb Williams is fine within that offense. But once you get to the NFL, that talent disparity drops. And you don't have the same disparity. Like, he's not going to play Fresno State 
or some you know, bumfuck college somewhere. He's going to be playing all professionals. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that that is a difference. And when he gets drafted to a team, they're not going to want him to go off script. He's going to have to learn by the NFL system in a way. And even Fields to that extent. Lamar Jackson, if you don't think Lamar Jackson goes through his progressions and does those things before the play breaks down, then I think you're kidding yourself. I don't think that John Harbaugh is like, yeah, do whatever you want. It doesn't really work that way in football in general. And so the Bears are in this kind of tough position where I think that they probably feel pressure to take this guy. But is he going to work with Eberflus, who couldn't make Justin Fields work? And then is Fields going to stay on the bench? Like, it sounds like a mess to me in Chicago. Yeah, I mean, I have said before, I think that you know the Bears coached the Justin Fields out of Justin Fields, and which was just very strange to me. But... The Caleb Williams piece, I can see both sides. I can understand, like, you may not want to go to a dysfunctional franchise, and the Bears certainly appear to be functioning as a dysfunctional franchise. On the other hand, if you're the Bears, you you can't build around a guy that's already out there voicing things like this, that he doesn't want to come be a part of that. Like, you can't build on that. That's not a, that's not a cornerstone or a pillar to building a successful team and franchise moving forward so what do they do i don't know i mean if there's anything i know about the bears they're they're gonna screw it up um, (laughs) one way or another yes and and they've got what so they get the number one and then i think they're still they're up there in the top 10 again yeah yeah Um, they have a couple picks in the top 12 yeah and so i know you know i think a lot of people expect them maybe with that their second pick and in the top 10, like it might be like around six or seven to take Marvin Harrison Jr., which I think would be a good pick. But, you know, you could move some things around. You could just trade back a couple spots if there is somebody that wants Caleb Williams or one of these other quarterbacks. But like you mentioned, there's not there's not a guy that stands out. There are no sure things, and you know, I don't think in this draft at quarterback. There really isn't much of a, there's not such a thing as a sure thing really anymore either. And when you, you know, cause, well, we got Caleb Williams, Drake May, uh, obviously Michael Penix will be there, Bo Nix, J.J. McCarthy. I mean, there's going to be, you know, but these aren't guys that. Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels. Um, they're, not, they, they're all very talented. They're great college quarterbacks. But I can't watch any of them and say, like, that dude is going to be a franchise quarterback somewhere for a decade or yeah. longer. And another thing, and, and my dad mentioned a bit, uh, kind of in the chat, is compared to the NFL and compared to the NFL in college, all receivers are open. You know, th- these, these guys are open all the time. When you get to the NFL, nobody's open. These windows are so small. You have to throw guys open and that requires a, a very unique skill set that you don't necessarily have to have at the college level. And, and you've got to be able to develop it. And I think that's a big reason too. You see guys struggle trying to make that transition from college to the pros. I agree. And there's no such thing as a sure thing in the draft anyway. As we know, it's basically like gambling. Like you're just hoping that your scouting has been good enough and that when you bring a guy in, he can essentially make good on what you think that his ceiling is. But I said this a couple weeks ago, and I still think it should be in play for the Bears. Although with their current head coach, had they kept the same staff, I think this would have made more sense. But Justin Fields obviously showed that there was some flash there. So why not try and go one of these teams that's right underneath you to trade up to that spot, get some capital for it, and then take Marvin Harrison early because I think he's a sure thing at wide receiver in this league. At least he seems like he should be, right? So give Justin Fields another weapon along with DJ Moore, who he finally got some chemistry with late in the season, and let them do their thing. Their defense should get better, and they should obviously protect Justin Fields, but I feel like try to get what you can for the number one pick because you don't need to take Marv number one. Nobody would bat an eye, I don't think, if that's what they wanted to do, but you probably can get a team to come up and get that spot and get a bunch of draft capital for it. I mean, look at what happened last year, right? The Panthers and the, I mean, all this draft capital they gave up to take Bryce Young and then you got the Texans who were like, yeah, well, we're good. You know, like, we'll take C.J. Stroud. It's cool. And you never know. But 
you're right. The Bears are going to mess it up. I don't see a scenario where yes. they do the right thing or the 100%. smart thing. And Marvin Harrison is going to get drafted early. He's totally going to get drafted early. So, if I, but if I'm the Bears, I want that guy because the Commanders are next. And then the Patriots. Both of those franchises arguably need a quarterback. So they're, they might be wanting to come up or maybe whoever's at number four. Try and leverage what you have. That's what smart teams do. And the Bears are not a smart team, unfortunately. And I think they're no. going to get stuck in this position where they're going to have a coach who sucks and then they're going to draft the wrong guy. These things aren't going to mix and they're going to have to start over again. And I can understand Bears fans, and we should shout out our boy Ryan Leskis. Pain Productions is his podcast if you want to go listen to it. P-A-I-G-N after Champaign, Illinois. But he was getting fired up yesterday because their team and their franchise stinks, quite frankly. And he's tired of it. And I said to you, this is what perennial losing looks like. Because you were surprised at how confrontational he was with us joking about Baker Mayfield. Yeah, he was fired up, man. He's, I mean, I, I don't know him well just through, you know, the little, our little podcasting community of people, but um, he seems like a super laid back guy. And he, yes, I mean, he great is. guy by as far as I can tell. Um, so it was, it was a little, uh, it was interesting to see him get so fired up. Which I don't blame him. I'd be pissed too, man. I said my news feed on Facebook is full of people that are pissed <laughs> at how, I mean, I can, I watch. The emotional roller coaster that these folks go through every Sunday uh, during the games, and it's it's painful, and they've been dealing with it for a while. And I think when I, I heard something today that it's been was it thirteen years? It was thirteen or nineteen? I thought I don't know why those two numbers are sticking out in my head since they've won a playoff game, and it's just nuts, man. Because to me, it doesn't feel like that long ago that you know they played the Colts in the Super Bowl and they were. They were making the playoffs, making runs to the NFC Championship game, and and here we are, man. Like, my how far they have fallen. I agree with you wholeheartedly. So we will watch that dumpster fire unfold as the offseason takes place. The next team we want to highlight is the number two pick, and that is the Washington Commanders. So Riverboat Ron finally gone, mercilessly gone. This is the destination that, to me, maybe the wild card for Bill Belichick because they just hired a GM that they got from the 49ers who also did GM work with the Patriots. So there's a connection there. The interesting factor to me is that they kind of are not as set at quarterback and their defense wasn't very good. And then they've got Eric Bieniemy as their offensive coordinator who I think took that job to try to prove himself to get a head coaching job somewhere. His name hasn't been talked about at all for any of these head coaching gigs, right? So it's fascinating. But Washington, new owner, I could understand them being interested in this move. I don't think it's the right move for them personally. I don't think Bill Belichick is the way that they're going to get back to this. But I could see them as a franchise who's consistently done the wrong thing for a very long time, getting Belichick and then taking Caleb Williams. And that feels like an absolute disaster. Yeah, that that's a really weird combination. Uh, th there are a lot of parallels, man, between the Bears and the Commanders in terms of kind of how they've been run. Uh, two two proud proud organizations yes. and fan bases that have had success, that have been to the top of the mountain, uh, and have really been mediocre for the last uh, close to a decade, you could say. Um, on average anyways. And it's a, again, it starts at the quarterback position. They've had a hard time nailing down that franchise quarterback. There's been a bit of a revolving door at the head coach position. And I mean, I guess, you know, they, they had Kirk cousins. They did. Um, they franchised him for as long as they could. And, and I mean, not that Kirk cousins has lit the world on fire um, in Minnesota, but I think that if, you could go back in time. I think you would probably just hang on to him. Uh, it's a very low ceiling, high floor, Kirk Cousins, you know, and I think sometimes you just got to be happy with with the high floor and see where see what you can put around him and see what that gets you. But the the thought of Belichick going there seems weird. The only way it makes sense to me is, you know, we talked about some of these older coaches and coaching, coaching with, uh, you know, the ways of the past and 
Belichick would probably feel like he was in the past coaching at FedEx Field because it is it hasn't been updated since the 70s oh, it's I don't think so, so. awful like <laughs> I, this is a local team for me and I have to admit I'm not a Commanders fan whatsoever I laugh at that organization because of what they do the fans around here have kind of come around a little bit I think that they haven't talked themselves into them being good in a few years now whereas before it was like every year oh we're going 10 wins and it's like what are you talking about this is a six win team at best and then the team would stink and they would be like, I can't believe they're this bad again. And it's like, well, you haven't been watching because the organization doesn't make good decisions. And I think people thought around here that once we get rid of Dan Snyder, that the whole thing is going to be made better. And it's not going to be instantly made better. There are a lot of things that have to happen for you to be a good football team. And it takes time. So the new owner is good. But is the new owner worth a damn? Or is he just a rich guy? who is not going to make the right decisions, not going to make the right hires, but hiring a guy from the 49ers who are clearly talented, clearly bring in a lot of talent, is a good move. I think you need the right coach to make this happen, but if they're still uncertain at quarterback, they need to make the right pick, and I think that, again, they're going to have their choice. But the question is, do they move up to take their guy? Like, if the Bears call and say, do you want this pick, is it smart for you to give up a lot just to move up that one spot to get the guy that you want, knowing that the Bears probably don't take a quarterback, but that they could take a quarterback? That's the intrigue for me with the Commanders. Is do they just hope that the commit that they do they hope that the Bears don't take their guy, or do they just move up and say screw it, we're going to go get our guy? But that could mortgage the future for later. So there's decisions that could possibly be made. And oh by the way. If they hire Belichick, does Belichick take the guy that he knows the Patriots want? So much intrigue. <laughs> uh, that is funny. And Bill Belichick, he uh, totally I, doing even it. my even my pettiness doesn't rival Bill Belichick's. No, but um, I mean, the Bears, if the Bears are going to take a quarterback, they should move the pick. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to stay there otherwise, in my opinion, uh, because there, there's too much to gain by moving off the pick if you're not going to take a quarterback. You know, so yeah, do the commanders move up? I don't, like you said, I don't, on the surface, there's not a huge disparity between these top four or five guys that are going to be coming out, Probably I don't not. think. And and they all kind of have different styles, so it's a matter of what you think. What do you value in a quarterback? What do you think fits with what you're wanting to do offensively? Um, you don't go that route, but. I, I don't even know that they necessarily have to move up. Again, unless you're worried about whoever it is that ends up in the number one spot, that they're going to take whoever your favorite guy is to, whether it's Caleb Williams or Drake May or whoever else. So I, I'm i not sure, man. Like, we talk about the owners, and as you said that, what I, I couldn't help but think is, you know what the best kind of owners are? Are the ones that hire football people and then stay the hell out of the way. I agree. 100% with you. That's what made the Bob Kraft, Bill Belichick thing work. Kraft cut the checks. That's basically all that he did for a vast majority of the time. And guess what? They won a lot. Jerry Jones doesn't do that. He cuts the checks, but also is on the radio every week and is the GM. And guess what? Have won a Super Bowl in 30 years. I think that that does matter. And I think that the owners aren't always the most football savvy people, even if they played football. It's always good sometimes to be removed from those decisions and have somebody whose job it is to do exactly that. And I think that's an important piece that you're talking about here. And that's why I think that at least the commanders have done the right thing in getting a GM in. So this new owner is not going to probably be as meddlesome as other owners would be. And I think that does help because Daniel Snyder was meddlesome, wanted his own guys, all that good stuff, even when he had a GM. But it doesn't seem like that's going to happen in this particular case, because I think that they want to start fresh and they know this. But again, it's hard to make the right decisions because you talked about how there's not much of a difference. All that we know is all these guys are busts. None of these guys could actually make it. So everybody could be making a crappy decision here. But there is no tough decision. But I think for the commander specifically, being where you are, I don't know if I trade up because I think I want to have those assets to try to build around this new quarterback. And moving up one spot, I don't know how much more that buys them because, again, they're choosing between all these different guys who 
a lot of them probably don't necessarily have a chance to be like these high ceiling guys. But if you get the Kirk Cousins type, but you have a good team around them, you might be able to do something with that. Yeah, I, I mean, we're we're seeing it. We've talked about it. You know, we talked the whole Brock Purdy game management conversation. Yeah, just wait till the seventh round to take yeah. your QB. Um, you know, we had that conversation. I think if you've got the right pieces, and, you know, I, I would say we could agree that Brock Purdy is a guy that understands his role in the system, right? And he executes it and uh, at a high level. And you don't have to have the the flash and pizzazz of um, – of a Patrick Mahomes, you know, or Lamar Jackson, you, you know, I, the gate, the title game manager has such a negative stigma around it. And I don't, I, like we said, when we talk, I don't think it's such a bad thing to be a game manager. Nope. Um, at Cam, the end of the day, but Cam Newton's ears just perked up somewhere. <laughs> right. Uh, I tell you what, I don't know what you think about these quarterbacks coming out, but the one that I'm the most intrigued by that, I'm very curious to see where he goes and how he pans out is Michael Penix Jr. The only thing that I'm worried about with Penix is that from what I can tell, his mechanics are not very good. His mechanics are somewhat T Bowian in a way. And you could kind of see that in the national championship game. He's got a really weird wind up to his throw being left handed. I think that could limit him in the pros, but there's also a ton of guys who can help him work on that, right, and try to fix those mechanics. And one thing that the guys from political football were talking about during the national championship was that you could tell because of all the pressure, he was not used to not throwing completely on his feet. And so there was a lot of bad footwork that took place there. And I think that you need to work on that if you're going to be in the NFL. I agree that there is a lot of potential. I think Michael Penix is more raw than he seems to be when he plays in college. But if a team drafts him that has the ability to sit him, I think that's an advantageous position for him, not somebody who needs him to win right away. I don't think that and it's just my completely uneducated opinion, but watching him, I don't think that his skill set and his mechanics are NFL ready for a team that needs to win right now. That's a fair point. Now, one thing, I've always been of the opinion that when you're going to the NFL, from college to the NFL, when you get to the NFL, like, leave mechanics alone. Unless it, unless it is really something that is, is a simple tweak that is going to elevate your game in, in a significant way. Uh, and Like, maybe in Michael Penick's situation, you know, shortening his release a little bit. Right. Um, you know, and maybe it just as simple as that. Like, let's just shorten this thing up a hair uh, because there's no way you're going to be able to get the ball out on time um, as your release is currently. Uh, but I think of, you know, I think of the money, money, the movie Moneyball when they were talking about, I think, uh, was it Chad Bradford or whatever? And, and Jonah Hill's character says, you know, this guy does this. Yeah, he's like, but nobody's nobody will sign him because he throws funny. Yeah. You know, just because of the way it looks. And I think that sometimes you can you can do more harm than good when you get into messing with mechanics. But simple tweaks, I mean, footwork something I don't think. I think that is, you can improve a thing like footwork. Yes. But I think there's so much muscle memory that comes with, uh, with throwing motion and that release that I think you got to be careful if you're going to, um, it's a, you got to be careful if you're going to dive into that because it would be like someone like me trying to work on a transmission. Uh, there's just a better chance that I'm going to screw it up. I might as well just keep riding on that thing until it blows up. Oh, sure. But in the <laughs> NFL, every second matters. Every split second matters. And so if he has a long follow through on his passes, and you talked about earlier, or you, and your dad talked about it too, how nobody's open. You've got to throw in these incredibly tight windows yeah. at the right time. And if his mechanics are slower than every other quarterback coming out, that was one of the biggest things about Tebow is you look at his mechanics, he was a very slow follow-through. Never could get the ball in at the right time when he had to. But when the guy was a winner, you loved his energy and everything. And the Penix, same thing, right? You loved everything. But And I don't even say his body language was bad during the national championship game. He just looked like, man, I we don't have anything. Like this team that didn't have anything. And you know what? It happens. Yeah. Michigan was significantly better. Their offensive line and defensive line bullied Washington all night. But I think when you look at Penix, the player, 
That's the only thing that worries me about him. But again, it remains to be seen because not every quarterback has been completely ready to go right off the bat. I mean, Tom Brady didn't start right away. There was a reason Tom Brady was a six-round pick. Nobody knew, and you never know. But I agree with you, that's intriguing, but I think that those are the concerns that I think people will have. But again, drafted to a team that doesn't need to win right away, he can learn, start to tweak some of these things like you talked about, and then maybe he's in a better position to win. But I think if like if the commanders take him, no chance. I, I really don't think there's any chance because I think that they don't have the luxury of letting him sit. Maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem that way. The fan base doesn't want that. It seems like the organization doesn't want it. So there's a lot of intrigue with the draft. And as we get into draft season, now I will say this, Coach and I are not draft experts. We don't really have an appetite for doing mock drafts or anything like that. But I think the intrigue that happens, at especially at the top end of the first round, is fun to sort of banter about. So we'll banter about some of these teams as the offseason progresses. But we still got football playing right now as the NFL season isn't over yet. So the wild card or super wild card weekend, as we're calling it, Right now, today, there were two matchups, Texans and Browns, and this game right now, which is Dolphins and Chiefs. As it stands right now, three minutes left in the third quarter. Chiefs are up 19-7 to and are just needling them to death. Death by a thousand cuts. The Dolphins have absolutely nothing offensively because they feel like it's negative 27 degrees. Let's be perfectly honest. But let's go back to the Browns for a second. So that Joe Flacco thing was fun for a while, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And and I sent you that text right before, you know, it just really got out of hand. And that was that is is Joe Flacco everything Kirk Cousins wishes he could be. <laughs> That's a and, good question. Um because they're very similar players. High floor, low ceiling guys. Flacco got a Super Bowl under his belt. But um uh, but both do seem kind of like that just dad type dude, you know, whatever. And I think it, it was a cool moment for Flacco because he got to come back. I think one of the things they said on the broadcast was he really enjoyed the fact that his kids are now of the age. They got to really see and understand what it was that he was doing. And and he really enjoyed that. You know, they got to see dad be a starting quarterback in the NFL and then, you know, play in the playoffs. And so, um, you know, I thought that was pretty neat, some of those stories that lie on the periphery. But, you know, I really thought – I thought the Browns had had something, man, going into the playoffs here. And, uh, my goodness, I still, at every turn, man, I just keep underestimating and underappreciating the Houston Texans. Are you ready? Like, are you ready? I've been telling you this for a while now, and you've been making fun of me and telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. They should have. This is my opinion. They should have given C.J. Stroud the rookie of the year at halftime of that game and given D'Amico Ryans the coach of the year at halftime of that game. Hard stop. And then guess what? The second half, they blew the doors off of it. That team is overachieving beyond what anybody thought that they were. And I understand everybody thought, well, we're going to find out in the playoffs. Well, you just found out. You effed around and you found out. And 45 spot against the defense that had been Easily one of the best in the entire league. The Texans are here, folks. They're here. Yeah, so they're going to have to go to Baltimore, right? Unless sure. the steel, unless well, I think unless the Steelers win, or possibly if Miami pulls this off, I think Miami's that, not pulling this no, off at all. The, I think they uh, they would they'll have to go to Baltimore. But if the Steelers were to win, or Miami would come back, as you say, won't happen, which I agree. Um, then they would get. I guess it'd be the Chiefs. So I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting to see. I mean, how you know they got to play a home game, so they're gonna have to go on the road most likely. And um, you know, rookie quarterback, rookie head coach on the road in the playoffs with a trip to the AFC Championship game on the line. Well, we're gonna find. I mean, these guys they're the real deal. They're not imposters by any means. But we're really gonna find out kind of what they're made of next weekend for sure. Sure, but I'm not saying that they're Super Bowl caliber, but... Uh, well, I, you can't say they're not at this point. I'm, no, I'm not. you can, but I'm, I am. But I'm saying, like, they, nobody thought they were going to be in the playoffs. They, this was a bottom feeder team. And the interesting parallel here is last year, we said this about the Jags, remember? The Jags had that comeback win, and we thought, okay, the Jags are emerging. Trevor Lawrence, finally with a good coach, emerging. 
And then this year, they laid an egg. But remember last year, they went to Kansas City. That was their litmus test, and it was close. So the Texans are going to get that. But the thing is with the Texans, nobody thought that they would be here. Nobody did. And C.J. Stroud outplayed everybody's expectations. And it seems like they have a great base to build upon. And it's a fun story. Next year, though, they're going to play a harder schedule. They're not going to take teams by surprise. And that's when you'll see the growth. The Jags obviously crumbled at the end of the season due to some injuries and such. And it's just a fun story because nobody even thought, like, if the Tex- if you said, oh, the Texans will win by four, sure, 45 to 14, nobody had that. Come on. No, he dominated the game. And it was, it was impressive, man. Like, that's the most I've watched a, a single game of the Texans and C.J. CJ Stroud this year at all and i was impressed and i did i came away from that game man like i if i give you if i throw any more shade your way about thinking that those guys should be the front runners for rookie of the year and coach of the year i say that and i watch it the lions <laughs> the, the lions which it, it's based off the regular season right what happens in the playoffs sure does, i know does not apply right no it doesn't so so even if the Lions win the Super Bowl, it doesn't change. No, it doesn't change uh, anything. Anything. So I get um, it. Look, man, Dan Campbell is your idol. You want to be the guy. <laughs> I totally understand. It's just impressive to me because it's just again far and away beyond what I think people thought would be the seal, like the ceiling outcome of this year. And I like it. I like that story. That's the kind of story that this show usually gravitates towards. We like that kind it of is. thing. And so doesn't matter if they get slammed next week or not. The Ravens are good. We know this. But this is a team that feels like they were a couple of years away. Stroud needed to take his lumps and needed to figure some things out. It doesn't mean that that won't happen next year. But that outcome was surprising. But I will say this about the Flacco thing. This is, again, very similar to all the other great stories that we've seen for a very short period of time. Joe Flacco, before this season, was playing with the Jets and looked like an old, aging quarterback, okay? And you bring him back with, what, he had five games or four games at the end of the season, and, yeah, he looked really, really good. I'll give you that. But guess what? This is a game that they were down, and they had to come back, and now you're going to ask a 38-year-old quarterback to throw a lot so they can come back in this game. He threw two pick sixes. That was in the range of outcomes. It was going to happen. Everything was going to come down to the mean. Everybody wanted to give this guy comeback player of the year. Stop. Like, it was a fun story. I get it. But stop. Like, Joe Flacco was never going to get this team to the Super Bowl, in my opinion. And they're out now. And now Deshaun Watson, that's the best outcome for Deshaun Watson. Could possibly be better. Well, Joe Flacco is certainly not the answer moving forward for the Browns, even if they won that game. Um, I don't think you go into next season, no matter what happens, what would have happened with Joe Flacco as your starting quarterback. No, but I'm saying people thought that he had found this like untapped fountain of youth. I'm like, there's a difference between playing a whole season and coming in for a short stint. And then you get to the playoffs, everything is different. And the Browns had to play from behind for the entirety almost of that game against the Texans. And the Texans punched him in the face, and the Browns couldn't handle it. The Browns anything, defense didn't do what they do, usually. If anything, the Browns showed it doesn't matter who the hell the quarterback is, you know, that they were they were pretty decent. They were able to figure it out. And that just then poses the question, what could they do with a, a stud quarterback um, that's beyond what they've had here recently? They so, would have you believe that they have that on their roster because they paid him $240 million guaranteed. But I don't think that they have that on their roster, personally. But I'm just saying Deshaun Watson loves seeing that because he had to have been a little nervous watching this team succeed without him. And to go to the Super Bowl would have been catastrophic for his contract because the second he came back, the expectations are high. Now it's like, oh, you can write this off as, well, they had four different quarterbacks and we didn't think that we'd even be here once he got hurt. And now he can come in and try to be the savior. Still not convinced he's that guy, though. I think the Browns... Have a lot of talent. Their defense is very good. But their quarterback situation is still to be determined. In the NFL, that never works. Let's chalk it up to another happy ending for Deshaun Watson. Oh, that's <laughs> a great one. You like that, huh? So we got Dolphins and Chiefs here. 
in this game right now, the outdoor temperature is negative 7 degrees. The wind chill is negative 27 degrees. Many people were talking about the Buffalo Steelers game, which was moved to Monday due to snow. I asked you a fundamental question before we came on here. Is it a little nuts that they're playing this game? And you and I can both agree that it kind of is a little bit. Yeah, it's a little crazy. I mean, if you're going to cite things like health and safety when looking at the Buffalo situation. Now, the Buffalo situation may just simply be a, a matter of the fact that it the roads are impassable. That's and what it is. The stadium's full of snow. And, you know, that's a different story. There's a lot of work that has to go into making that happen. Um, it's just cold in Kansas City, really cold. But I say just cold. I'm not trying to take away from how miserable it probably is. But I do think that there is a difference. But also, you, I can make an argument that if health and safety is your thing, that it, it can't be super safe for these people to be out in these temperatures for these extended periods of time. I mean, the players, they've at least got these giant heaters and the best cold weather gear money can buy at their disposal on the sidelines. Um, they're wearing like diving know, suits, which is great. Saw yeah, like scuba gear. Yep. And I thought, uh, but I just, I mean, imagine the the poor schmuck that's up in the up in the top row. You know what I mean? Just freezing his butt off in his blue jeans and jacket. That's you know, what I, I wanted mean, to ask just... you though. Who's crazier, <laughs> players or the fans? Oh, the fans. The players are getting paid millions of dollars to be out there. The you know the, the fans, fans paid for this paid experience. hundreds of dollars to be there. So definitely the fans, 100% the fans. By the way, my brother-in-law told me that you could get a ticket to this game for $28 as of last night. Yeah, I, I did see that it wasn't full. I wonder if that breaks some. The tickets were likely sold. Yes. So it'll still count as a sellout. It will, like, I wonder. Yes, it will still yeah. count. But a lot of fans, because I... I, he told me this, and he's like, would you go? I was like, no, 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 no. You'd have to pay me to go to that game. And I'm not sure what it would take. I really don't know what it would take. Negative 27, like none of that feels good, for, especially for a first-round game. Just no way. At, like couldn't be further from where I would be. I'm warm right now. That's yeah, a great we, outcome. I had it turned on upstairs uh, and before I came down, and my daughter, you know, she's sitting there. She's watching. She, it's it's so funny, but it's also cringy. Like she loves. She's like, oh, is this the Kansas City Chiefs? And she knows the Kansas City Chiefs and Travis Kelsey because of Taylor Swift. God. Man, like that's it. And it's like, yes, this is the Chiefs. She's like, I want to watch this. And I'm like, you yell all the time about there being football on the TV. You know what I mean? But my goodness, you know Taylor Swift's in attendance, and here we go. But um, I, we were talking about how cold it was, and then they showed some idiot in the crowd he didn't have a shirt on or anything else he's like why doesn't that guy have a shirt on i said because he's crazy darwin award winner early early candidates yeah. for darwin early candidates for darwin award come from these cold nfl football games because people are just insane absolutely insane so as we mentioned the steelers bills moved to monday night because snow i get it okay but it's just funny because like I said, this game, they're like, yeah, we're cool. But then with in Buffalo, it's like, yeah, we'll move it. But I, I think it has more to do with the NFL being like, hey, we want people to be in these seats. And it's dangerous to get to the game. Yeah, whatever. They just want to make sure that they can get butts in the seats because they don't want to televise a game that nobody is at because that doesn't do anything for the NFL. That game is the most boring game of the weekend to me because the Steelers, unless they're going to grind this out to an absolute halt, which is not fun football to watch at all. Like the Steelers have been cringeworthy to watch this year and unless they can get yolo josh allen i don't think they really have a chance so i'm not really intrigued by that game at all but you never know mike tomlin super bowl winning coach with mason rudolph somehow again in in pittsburgh you never know but that game will be monday night the other two games are the more or the other three games the more intriguing to me cowboys packers so on paper this doesn't look like a matchup at all however this is that weird game in the playoffs that the Cowboys always seem to struggle with. And in comes Jordan Love, who's actually looked really good the last few weeks. The Packers have put some things together. They run the football really well. The Cowboys defense has struggled against the run. But even saying all of that, the Cowboys looked so good against the Commanders that I just can't see them losing a home game to a team that feels like they're at least a year away because this effectively was Jordan Love's rookie season. No, I, there's a lot there with that game. The, obviously, the Mike McCarthy connection. I think that, you know, we've seen in the past where the team, one of these wildcard teams, 
that, which I guess they, yeah, wild card teams that finish the season hot, kind of on a heater, go on a run, you know, and I feel like the Packers are sort of poised to be that team. And is there any other team that has been lucky enough to basically what appears that the Packers are doing, and that's go three in a row at the quarterback position? You can I mean, make, make an argument. Wow. He's not quite there yet, but – to have there not be a significant drop off in the first year without Aaron Rodgers, Packers fans have to feel pretty good about that. Doesn't mean that Jordan Love is the answer. It doesn't mean that he's going to be at that caliber. But to not have a drop off is great. Now they did take their lumps in the middle of the season, and I want to shout out my man Braylon, who is the commissioner of my fantasy football league, the Royal League of Thumb Tappers. They actually made us hats and stickers and everything. So I got. Nothing out except for that for my 50 bucks. I asked for a refund today. I did not get that. And anyway, but they took their lumps, but they started to put some things together. And yes, you're right. They kind of are one of those teams. I would make an argument in the next game that there is a team that's coming in kind of in the same vein that I picked to go to the Super Bowl. But I think the Packers are going to give them a run for their money. But I just feel like the Cowboys aren't going to lose to a team like that. And they're going to lose to a better football team, I feel like, because that's what they've really had a problem with is beating a good football team this year. And they may like not the Detroit Lions. Well, we'll see. But it's an intriguing game. I don't I didn't even think about the McCarthy thing because they're not playing at Lambeau. And I think it's just ancient history at this point. But yeah, the, maybe so. The real narrative is can the Cowboys stop losing games like this in the playoffs? I think they're going to break that curse. You talked about your Detroit Lions. And they're playing the St. Louis, oh, excuse me, good Lord, that's an old one. They're playing the Los Angeles Rams, and Matt Stafford is coming back to Detroit in a playoff game, which is ironic because it's something that Detroit didn't see a lot of while he was there, despite him playing with Calvin Johnson all of those years, and they traded him away because Matt Stafford wanted to go to a contender, and the second he went to a contender, what did he do? Won the Super Bowl. This Rams team, though, was a weird team because... They were high at the beginning, three and six at one point, finished 10 and seven, I believe. This is a dangerous team, in my opinion, because they have a veteran Super Bowl winning quarterback who has clearly elevated the wide receivers around them. It's just a matter of can those young guys step up in the right moments? And the Lions are a young team as well. This is an this is the most intriguing matchup, in my opinion, of this weekend. Yeah, I agree. You know, and you have Jared Goff on the other side of this, right? Who's yes. the guy that the Rams let go uh, for Matthew Stafford? And so many storylines in this game. I love it. it I'm here. You, you know, McVeigh's got a you know been to the Super Bowl twice, won one, and obviously Stafford won one. Veteran quarterback, like you mentioned, guys played a lot of football. Uh, Dan Campbell hasn't been in the situation before. A lot mm-hmm. of guys on that roster likely haven't been in this situation before. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle the emotion of it. And that's one thing is that Dan Campbell appears to be a very emotional person. Um, and he lets his emotions, you know, uh, leak in, if you will, to his coaching decisions and how he goes about his business, which I think he owns that. He he knows that's who he is and he doesn't try to shy away from it and that's fine. But sometimes in a game like this, that can be a little reckless. Um, I'll admit that. Which is what I talked um, about with the Cowboys game. We kind of debated right. about that, right? And you said, well, that's, yeah. what the, that's what's gotten them here. But there are moments, the playoffs are those moments where you need to rein that in. And McVeigh and Stafford, having been there together, I think is a wild card in this, personally. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you're right. And I, I do think this is going to be a very good game. It is an interesting one because, you, you know, the, the Rams are hot and – you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of weird probably emotions that are tied up in this game, but uh, you know obviously the long playoff victory drought for the Lions, um, the return of Matthew Stafford, the you know maybe Jared Goff feeling slighted uh, to some degree and wanting to stick it back to the Rams, uh, a lot of stuff going on, and then obviously the fact that it's just simply a playoff game and you're playing to uh, keep your season going and have a chance to win a Super Bowl. Um, I, I take it that the Rams may be your Super Bowl pick? Well, they are, yes. I, I thought that they would go to the Super Bowl. They feel like one of those teams that nobody's really giving a chance, but
but with their quarterback who's playing really well right now, and again, it's a young team, but a young team with a veteran quarterback a lot of times doesn't play as young as a young team with a young quarterback. Now, Jared Goff is not a young quarterback, but the coaching thing, like that's that's what intrigues me about all this because, again, you have a lot of veterans on the other side in the important places, and that happens a lot. I mean, look what the Falcons did where they had Matt Ryan and they had Dan Quinn and they go up 28-3 against the Patriots. But on the other side is two guys who are like, doesn't matter what the situation is, we have to do what we have to do. And Dan Quinn got outcoached in that game to the point that the comeback that nobody saw coming that would never happen in a thousand other tries of that game. Still contend this. I realized that I left and turned off the game in the third quarter. Fine. <laughs> Tell me. But I still contend that 999 other times that they played that game, the Falcons win that game 998 of the of those times. So I was in the right. But I'm just saying. So if uh, not to put the cart before the horse here, but if the Rams were to to win the Super Bowl, do you think that Matthew Stafford rides off into the sunset? That's question one. Question two is, is Matthew Stafford a Hall of Famer or would he need it? And would winning the Super Bowl, another Super Bowl, solidify that fact if he isn't already? So this is interesting because I think before the last Super Bowl, my initial answer would have been no, very, very swiftly. He won the Super Bowl and then is hurt. And I feel like this season coming back, when he didn't have to come back, because a lot of people thought he was going to retire, and a completely new team, to the point that I think his wife had made some off comment in the off season that he didn't even know everybody's name. And to take that into this, and then if he wins the Super Bowl with that, elevating a guy named Puka Nakua, which I think Dave said sounded like a Harry Potter spell that made people throw up. And <laughs> to take that... And win a Super Bowl with it, to me, I think then gets him to that promised land. Now, if they don't win the Super Bowl this season, is he a Hall of Famer? That one is hard for me. But also, he did play with Calvin Johnson. And Calvin Johnson had a record-breaking season that year. And when he was the quarterback for the Lions, they did go to the playoffs often enough that it puts him in that upper echelon. He's definitely the best quarterback in Lions history. Again, what that says in the larger narrative, I don't know, your mileage varies, but I would probably lean toward more of a yes than a no, even if they don't win the Super Bowl. If he does win it, it's a definite yes, because not many guys with two don't go in. And his two were not one because he wasn't a part of it. Like he would be an integral part of both of them. And so if Eli Manning gets in, Matt Stafford has to get in with two, hands down. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think he's borderline now, but I think he is. I, I would say more yes than no, just like you. I feel the exact same way. And that a victory here this year, if he gets to that point, would solidify it. And I also think that, and he may retire regardless of what happens, but I think if they win the Super Bowl, he definitely hangs her up. Yes. So that's the intriguing matchup for me. Now, the last game is on Monday night, I believe, and is Eagles Bucks. This one is intriguing, first of all, with the Nick Sirianni stuff we talked about earlier. But then you have no A.J. Brown. That was announced today. The Eagles have mightily struggled the last few games of the season. They started 10-1, and finished 1-5. and A lot of turmoil in that locker room. And then here come the Tampa Bay Bucks with Baker Mayfield, who, in my opinion, should be comeback player of the year. I know DeMar Hamlin died. I get it. But football-wise, Baker Mayfield has played his ass off. They won a division title, and they have a home game against a really, really struggling Eagles team. And I could not be rooting harder for Baker in this situation. I want to see him get that playoff win with a team that everybody thought was tanking after Brady left. Yeah, I do too, man. Like, I, I picked the Eagles because that just felt like the smart choice, I guess. Uh, but I would love to see the Bucks win this game. I think that... You know, I like, yeah, Baker came out of, he's not the type of guy I would typically like because he was kind of arrogant coming out of college. And he still has that too, has a little bit of that in him for sure. But I think he's been, he got humbled a little bit. I agree. And I think that he's got all those great traits that made him good at Oklahoma and have the success he had in Cleveland. You know, he is kind of a gritty guy that goes out there and gives 
think the guy just plays hard. He's a competitor. And I think he's got all those positive things now without a lot of that, uh, a lot of that ego that he maybe had earlier in his career, and especially when he was at Oklahoma. So I would love to see the Bucks get the win. But I feel like, man, like there's the Eagles are going to have, I mean, they got to be in like desperation mode because that you're on the, you know, they went to the Super Bowl last year. It looks so good to start off this year. If things really fall apart, like they may all of a sudden be like in rebuild mode. <laughs> I mean, just like that, you know, a reset. And obviously, as we talked about earlier, Nick Sirianni may be coaching for his job, possibly. And so it, it, it will that will all of those factors sort of come together to will it bring the team together to motivate them to make this final push? Or will things just, you know, at the first sign of adversity against the Bucks, will things start to fall apart? But we've been looking for them to get that get-right game for six games now. True. And they haven't been able to put it together. And I just think that they're not going to be able to pull it together for whatever reason, whether it's internal struggle with the team, whether it's the wrong. I don't know what it is, but this team was dominant last year. And if not for that fumble right before halftime in the Super Bowl, may have actually won the whole damn thing. And it's just amazing how things change. And I just don't have a good sense, which means I said this to somebody the other day, the Eagles are the most uncertain team in the field right now, and they're probably going to go to the Super Bowl because that's NFL. That's how football yeah. works, right, is you just never know. You and I, no matter what, watching football for 40 years, 70-something years combined, and we still know nothing when, it, when all of it comes down to it because in these one-game samples, everything is on the table. All outcomes are on the table, except for this Chiefs game because it's 26 to 7 right. now and the Dolphins have absolutely no chance. But my point being is like, you just never know. And there is that kind of intrigue in the NFL that doesn't exist in college because most of the time, a heavy favorite wins so often. And that doesn't mean NFL is better, it's just different. I don't feel sure. the same way about the NFL playoffs. Like, I don't feel this, like, this pull, but. Watching college football, I do feel that pull. So it's just a difference. But the NFL playoffs will be intriguing, in my opinion, and we'll see. Our picks are going to be terrible. Like, the Rams are probably going to lose big this weekend, and who cares? I mean, who cares? Yeah, we did a uh, – my my boss, she printed out, like, some sheets, sort of almost like bracket sheets. It was like, hey, everybody circle your winners for this weekend's NFL games. And a couple people are like, oh, my gosh, I have no idea. I don't know anything about football or whatever. I'm like – I said nobody even does. better. Yeah, even I better. said nobody does. I said <laughs> so. Go ahead. Don't worry it about it. Yeah, it's like the even with the we do a bracket challenge for the NCAA tournament at work, and there's always people like I have no idea. I'm like you're probably better off not knowing anything, honestly, because it seems like you know you could know unless you're an expert, you basically just know enough to mess it up for yourself you know, and overthink it or whatever the case may be. So it's just funny. And if you know nothing, you pick mostly truck in the NCAA tournament, which once you get to the end is generally what you get most of the time anyway. So those people are the ones that win those bracket challenges, and it drives me insane. Yeah, it's funny. Um, the the CEO, she was filling out her sheet, and she's talking about how she does it. And she said, uh, like, it was hilarious to hear her, like, process. She's like, oh, the I don't even know who it was she was talking about. It might have been. Oh, she's like, oh, Miami and Kansas City. Oh, Miami, that place sounds warm. I'm picking them. Oh, like, boy. It's it just like that was, <laughs> it was just funny. Like, it, I mean, and there was one where uh, I think that it might have been like, let me think of these matchups here. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and think about it, but whatever it was, it might have been the two, the two mascots or something. And she's like, oh, that sounds way scarier than that. You know, I mean, it was just hilarious. Like her. Her whole process of picking, I thought it was funny. I just love Miami sounds warm when it's negative 27 feel <laughs> right. like, which is just absolutely incredible. Well, you mentioned brackets, and I want to make, I don't want to call it an announcement, but Coach and I finally are going to meet each other in person, and we will be in Charlotte, North Carolina for the first round of the NCAA tournament. It's something that we've talked about a lot on this show. We love the tournament. It's one of my favorite days of the year, and so... We are finally going to unite in person and have a blast in Charlotte, North Carolina, breaking in the NCAA tournament, watching some of that stuff. We just finalized the details the other day, and barring something unforeseen, which would just be what it is, we're going to make it down there 
March, I think it's March 21st, which is the first day of the tournament. And it's going to be an absolute blast. I cannot wait. We are going to do some content from down there just because, right? We'll do some lives probably from the stands, things like that, just to give you an experience of what it's like to be there. I've been to the tournament, but never the first round. I could not be more excited about this from a sports perspective. Yeah, I've never been. And uh, I think the first round to me seems like the most exciting one to go to. And obviously it doesn't you know, maybe have the prestige of the final four, or even the sweet 16 round. But I mean, really more than anything, it's just going to be the full experience, right? Us finally getting together, spending four days, hanging out, enjoying one of the best spectacles and sports, in my opinion. And, you know, I've been to Charlotte before. I think it's a, it's a, it's a really cool city and I'm the weather will be a little warmer down there than what I'm sure we'll be dealing with here <laughs> yes. in, uh, in mid to late March. So, uh, no, just looking forward to the nice little trip and obviously all the cool stuff that's going to come along with it. And I mean, without, I mean, I know that it's going to be an experience that, you know, I'll never forget. You are absolutely correct about that. So we got a couple of months before that takes place. It can't get to March fast enough. But between now and then, we have the Super Bowl. Obviously, we're going to do more Friday shows with the NFL playoffs coming up. And we're thinking about some new things for the off season. And we're going to bring you the best content year that we can possibly bring you this year. We're going to try to, again, do some more personalized content with some of these teams. We want to get into college basketball a little bit more, Bradley Braves, maybe even do some Virginia Tech talk over the course of the year. A lot of things are on the table for us content-wise, and I'm really looking forward to it. But at the end of it all, we just want to have fun, and we hope that you are having fun as well. A little bit of housekeeping before we end this for the night. If you want to find us on social media, TikTok at INC Sports, Twitter at Iceman and Coach, INC Sports on Facebook, the YouTube page, obviously, if you're here. If you want to listen to us on Apple or Spotify or wherever it is you want listen to your podcast, go ahead and do that. Make sure to hit subscribe. And the Matty Ice Media Network, MattyIceMedia.com for other podcasts that we have, like Fire Footwear, which is amazing because I host it. So, Brad, anything you want to say to anybody before we get out of here? No, thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, excited about the things that we're going to try to do moving forward. And I hope that people sort of engage with us more and let us know, you know, maybe teams that you're interested in and our you know, different specific sports stories you might be interested in because, you know, that's why we're here, man, is we want to entertain you and talk about stuff that not only we like, but things that you like. And um, excited to see how the rest of the first round of the NFL playoffs go here. Uh, throughout the next couple of days. And I mean, really, man, to be honest with you, I'm just going to be trying not to freeze my balls off the next few days. The wind chills are going to be like near 30 below the actual temperature. I mean, it's basically like Kansas City, what you're seeing on TV. That's how it is where I'm sitting right now. So it was 50 degrees today, but did not feel like 50. It felt like 35. So I don't know if that makes you feel better. <sighs> I'm sure you take that in a heartbeat. But stay warm, everybody. Stay warm, Brad. If you're at this game right now, you're an absolute savage if you're on this feed. But I want to thank everybody for their time. We'll see you next week. Make sure to stay safe out there. And we'll talk to you all next time. This is Football Friday. Opinions and viewpoints expressed on INC Sports are those of Matt Freights, Brad Powell, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. INC Sports is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and Brad Powell and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.